Okay, let's do this. Hit it. <clears throat> Back in my early 20s, as a graduate student in archaeology, I traveled to the Hopi Reservation. I was going to inform them about my scientific research on the Chaco Anasazi and what we all could learn from it. Instead, I found that the Hopi were not actually going to learn anything that they wanted to know about their ancestors from me. I left with a persistent concern about the value and relevance of archaeology to living people. And my interest turned towards studying the practice of archaeology, its history. This is my husband and the look he had on his face when I told him I was going back to graduate school for a doctorate in American studies. I persuaded him not to fear. Thanks to Pat Roth, then the registrar at the Museum of the Rockies, I had found a project that combined my interests in history and archaeology. It was a 400-page handwritten ledger that detailed the impressive artifact collection of the Billings area rancher, Oscar T. Lewis. Lewis was a man revered by locals as a passionate amateur archaeologist and derided by professionals as a mere pot hunter. This project was riddled with legend and controversy, and I was hooked. A true cowboy, Lewis was a colorful character who once willingly went buck naked into Montana's wilderness, emerging three months later fully clothed. In 1936, as the Dust Bowl and Great Depression took its toll, Lewis abandoned his ranch and found WPA relief work as foreman of the state's first professional excavations at the famous Billings area site of Pictograph Cave. He trained and supervised workmen, took copious field notes, and even cooked for the crew. Lewis had a magnetic personality and the energy of a man half his age. Despite his eighth grade education, he became well-versed in Plains archaeology. I began to wonder when and why Lewis's reputation had become so tarnished, just as I discovered that many artifacts from Pictograph Cave had ended up in his personal collection. Did he pilfer these artifacts while he was foreman? Perhaps not. He could have excavated them earlier when the site was still on private land. I knew that in the 1930s, government agencies had worked to recruit and train amateurs in rural areas, and as collectors know, Private land is fair game. Collecting on federal lands first became illegal in 1906. However, this act was essentially too weak to enforce. And decades later, as archaeology became increasingly professionalized, far stricter preservation laws were passed. Designed to protect sites from looters, these laws also marginalized amateurs and confused the public. This is because in the US, heritage resources are treated as property. Artifacts on public lands are federal property, and artifacts on private lands are personal property. So with little or no training, you too can dig your own site and become a reality TV sensation. This fact makes archaeologists shudder because sites are non-renewable resources of information. As archaeologists will tell you, Every artifact that is picked up and removed from its context is like ripping a page from a book. Information is lost and site integrity diminished. Though this is true, this metaphor often fails to persuade as it ignores the excitement of discovery and the human instinct to learn through touch. Somewhere in the last century, all amateur collecting became equivalent to pot hunting or, loot hunt, or looting, leaving little room for folks like Oscar Lewis or their collections. When museums, overstuffed as they are, turn away these non-scientific collections, the reality is that artifacts often end up in the trash. Many private collectors take great care to organize and document their artifacts. They seek collaboration and recognition and often wish to donate their collections. They are wary of laws and disillusioned with professionals who they see as judgmental, territorial, and dismissive, because they often are. Volunteer programs are one way to address this issue. Stewardship programs train volunteers to record and monitor threatened archaeological sites and create opportunities to participate in research. They involve the public in archaeological practice, which is essential because archaeology in the US is largely dependent on the public's enthusiasm as well as their tax dollars. Throughout the 20th century, the professionalism of archaeology not only marginalized amateurs such as Lewis, it virtually ignored the interests of descendant communities. Today, Native American scholars explain that being indigenous means that ancestral landscapes are powerful components of contemporary Native identity. And for many, archaeology remains a colonial endeavor, science conducted at their expense. 
This has begun to change with the growth of indigenous archaeology, which grounds research in values of reciprocity and relevance to community concerns, rather than exclusively professional goals. In listening to tribal elders and historic preservation officers, I found far less concern with activities of collectors than about having a seat at the table with land agency archaeologists. Tribes want to be treated as collaborators rather than merely consulted as informants, especially when major development projects threaten impact ancestral sites. Historically, the interests of both tribes and amateurs were disregarded for the goals of science and heritage preservation. In his later years, Oscar Lewis became embittered as younger professionals rebranded his contributions as pot hunting. He publicly claimed that he would rather bury what was left of his collection than leave it to a museum. Thankfully, his friend Joe Kramer ignored these sentiments, and after Lewis's death, spent nearly 20 years painstakingly labeling his artifacts and transferring his notes. So was Oscar Lewis a looter, and does it matter what we call him? My answers are, respectively, no and yes. Our reckoning of the past does matter to our present and our future. Who is in it, who is forgotten, and how people are labeled. Last year, I had the pleasure of showing Oscar Lewis's collection to his daughter, Mary, and most of his grandchildren, none of whom had any idea that this was now the property of the Museum of the Rockies. So, what I learned that day at Hopi is that not all professional archaeology is meaningful or even interesting. And what I have learned since then is that relevance is best achieved through listening and inclusive collaboration with all those who have a stake in the past. Thank you.